is the Pilot Rock Lumber Company, a name that has become a symbol for quality pine products, located midway between the Blue Mountains of Oregon and the mighty Columbia River. In this area of Pendleton, the principal city is world famous for its annual Roundup celebration. Our story begins about the time Columbus set foot on this land. This was how our tree looked then. But today our tree has become a giant of the forest and a national market demand has brought the axe of the woodsman and the groan and roar of machines to disturb its long peaceful sanctum. It seems a crime to cut such a nice tree, but this tree is mature and like fruit should be harvested when ripe or it will spoil. The United States Forest Service has been on the job and signs like this are posted on all roads leading into the forest. The logging manager has to do some heavy figuring to set up a logging program that will keep the mill supplied continuously. This picture was taken from the 80-foot tower of the Bone Point Lookout Station. The Forest Service has built several lookouts like this in the Umatilla Forest and keeps the lookout man on duty during the summer months. It is the duty of the lookout man to report to the ranger station all fires and their location. Thunderstorms keep him pretty busy sometimes, and actual strikes are occasionally seen from this tower. This panorama looks out over the North Fork of the John Day River, showing much fine grazing land. Timber is not the only crop of the area, but millions of feet of fine timber do grow in the watershed's tributary to the John Day. Here you see over Bridge Creek, the Upper North Fork, Desolation Creek, Meadow Creek, Hinton Creek, and down the North Fork. This embraces the main holdings of the Pilot Rock Lumber Company. The timber cruiser, logging manager, and production superintendent are shown discussing plans for a permanent camp and the road that will have to be built into the different watersheds. The camp is built, cottages for the married men, bunkhouse and cookhouse for the single men, and is located on the North Fork of the John Day River, conveniently and centrally located for the timber holdings of the company. US 395, the Three Flag Highway, passes directly in front. The camp has a Caterpillar diesel electric plant, constant oil heat, and modern plumbing. The management believes that a good group of loggers deserves good living conditions, and the company boasts of having both. The larger building houses recreation room, filing room, commissary, and shop. The last shown, is the pots room and fire cart. Here comes the bus with the skidding and loading crews. Among these men are the knot bumper, two crotch line hookers, top loader, two cat drivers, and two choker setters. The loading boss, skidding boss, one cat driver, one choker setter, and the unhooker came in another rig. After 15 minutes to clean up, the cook throws the switch on the electric horn, and the boys come and get it. Loggers are always hungry, so let's follow them in. Yes, they seem to have plenty of good old Blue Mountain chow. But let's get on with the story. Here is the logging manager's cottage. This is where careful studies are made of the aerial photographs the company has of every acre of timberland in the North Fork watershed. By the use of these pictures, the company saves much in determining the location of new roads and landings. Also, a fairly accurate estimate is possible in determining volume, species, and type of terrain. The use of the stereoscope makes hills and valleys clearly discernible. The cruiser commences his work of checking for volume and species, accompanied by his assistant, the compass man. A strip of trees about 60 feet wide is either measured or estimated, keeping on a straight course with the compass. Usually 20% of the total timber is measured, and the result multiplied by five. Locating roads so that the timber may be well served and getting easy straight grades at the lowest possible cost is not always an easy matter. Here the logging manager is running a favorable or downhill with a load grade by using the small instrument called the abney, set at 7%. An object is sighted ahead that the abney shows to be on grade. And the man walks toward his object, blazing trees as shown, so that the bulldozer that follows may be properly guided. Here comes the first big equipment needed for our logging project. This is a Caterpillar D8, 
equipped with a torno dozer. Down logs, trees, and brush are swept aside at one stroke, and at the same time, the ground is leveled. This operator with this cap will rough in a mile and a quarter of road in an eight-hour day when the going is similar to that shown here. Usually the operator will spend a day roughing in and the next day will go back and widen, straighten and remove all trees that may be on the shoulder of the roadway. Clearance must be allowed for trucks passing and a drainage ditch. The road, when ready for the grader, is usually 30 feet wide. The cat pushes over trees up to 30 inches in diameter. The tree shown here is about 18 inches in diameter. If the tree had been larger, the driver would have approached the tree from the other side, thereby getting more leverage. This is the Latorno rooter, and is used in this manner to loosen the rocks and cut the roots, so that the grader will have an easier chance to put in the ditches and shape the road. When rock bluffs are encountered, the compressor and jackhammer go to work. At one stroke of the detonator, rock points are blasted. Tons of DuPont 40 powder have been used in this manner. Dozens of bridges, such as this one, had to be built to cross the John Day River and its tributaries. These bridges, which will carry a 50-ton load, take about three days to build. They are constructed of logs placed in position by the Lorraine loader and decked with planks. The galleon grader shown in action here is very important in the finishing part of the new road grade. The road must be shaped, smoothed, and ditched so that the heavy rains that fall in the Blue Mountains during the late fall and spring may have proper runoff. This machine has finished road grades up to a mile and a half in one eight-hour day. The result was similar to what is shown here. A 20-ton roller usually packs the finished grade for graveling, but was missed when these pictures were taken. This grader also maintains roads being used, cleans out old ditches for winter, and keeps the snow graded off the road during the winter months. A good grader is vital to a smooth logging operation. As we mentioned earlier, the grasslands of the Blue Mountains fatten some of the finest beef cattle in the nation. The Pilot Rock Lumber Company leases all its rangeland to local cattlemen, but the cattle present somewhat of a problem in the logging operation. Whenever the barbed wire fences are cut for a roadway, a cattle guard such as this is installed. Now that the road grade is finished, bridges and cattle guards are installed, shale pits such as this must be located. Here is a splendid pit of natural shale that's within five miles of 50 million feet of timber. The Lorraine loader, primarily purchased for loading logs, is shown here loading out the shale with a three-quarter yard drag line bucket. The bucket can be attached or taken off in 10 minutes. The trucks used are Kenworth six-wheelers and are primarily for hauling logs. These 10-yard side dump gravel beds, built in the company's own shop, are mounted in a few hours and prove quite practical for getting a lot of shale out there on the road quickly. The loader is supported by a T7 cap with Latorno Dozer. With this combination, the company is able to put 700 yards of rock on its wet weather roads in one eight-hour shift. On this particular job, four large trucks were used to gravel six miles of main road and spurs, serving nine million feet of timber in just six days. The maximum distance hauled was three miles one way. While the loading goes on, the truck that is loaded is on its way to the dump. It takes only a few minutes to get there, but as the load rolls on its way, it helps to pack the rock into a firm roadbed. The grader previously shown 
grates the new shale as it is applied, thereby speeding up the hauling and smoothing the road for eventual log hauling. Putting on rock is done in midsummer during a short period that the mill closes down for its annual overhaul. No time is wasted in getting rid of the load, as is shown here. Once more, the galleon grader is used for spreading the shale evenly on the grade. Only two or three passes are necessary for this part of the operation, requiring five or ten minutes. The grader does this spreading after a dozen or more loads have been dumped. The spreading is done between trucks, so as not to hold them up. After the spreading is done, the grader resumes its work of patrolling the road already finished. Next, the shale must be thoroughly moistened, so it will pack down into the dirt grade. This sprinkler also wets down all logging roads being logged over during the summer months. The company finds it pays well to keep the dust down in summer, saving motors, as well as helping to keep a smoother road. This 20-ton roller, designed and built in the company shop in Pilot Rock, does a remarkable job of crushing the oversized rocks that get in the shale. If the rock is not broken up into small pieces, it is pushed out of sight into the dirt grade. This saves many tire bills for the logging truck, thereby doing its part in adding to efficiency and speeding up production. The truck drivers maintain that the roller is the best piece of road equipment that the company has. Now that the road is ready, it would seem we should be ready to start hauling logs, but this is not the case. Before the falling starts, the forest has to be carefully examined and trees marked for leaves. This shows the company forester examining and marking with a paint gun those trees that are to be left for the future loggers. The tree being marked here, or leave, is a fine example of a healthy pine that will grow many board feet of lumber in 30 or 40 years. It is in words, pops not right, so there is little danger of the tree dying within the next 50 years. This is an example of selective logging practiced by the company, a good investment for the future, crop. Thousands of acres are marked in this way, so that unlike the buffalo, the pine forest will be here to stay. Cutting strips are blazed through the forest by the scaler or the timber fallers who come later. These lines are blazed on trees with the axe as shown while following a straight compass course. The direction may be east and west or north and south depending on how it will divide the best stands of timber so that all falling teams may be treated fairly. Strips are 300 feet wide across the area that is to be logged. The fallers draw for cutting strips. Fallers, and here they come. The Army developed this rig to go anywhere, and it will almost. It leaves our nice logging road and goes right out into the woods. These fallers are a hardy, brave group of men equipped with shiny helmets, so they may have some protection from falling limbs, commonly known in the woods as widow makers. This tree must be the faller's first victim. First, the undercut is made on the side the tree is to fall. Then the saw is held in the wood until it is around to the back of the tree and out of the way. There it rests, while the piece cut out of the face of the tree is removed by the axe of Pulaska. It takes but a moment to make the back cut. Trees such as this are felled usually in less than two minutes. The fallers are all using distant 11-horse chain power saws. As the back cut deepens, the tree, if leaning just a little, will start to fall in the direction of the undercut. And then the call of timber rings out, and another giant of the forest is on its way to market. Timber! Let's see what the other crews are doing. Yes, they have trees ready to fall. It doesn't take long, and when they go down on the stumps, 
It is not as hard on the back as in the old days of the crosscut saw. But falling isn't all. Each set of cutters identifies this tree for the scaler by marking his number on the stump and on the butt end of the first log. Then they measure the tree into 33-foot lengths for bucking and proceed to chop the limbs free and clean from the top and both sides. Bucking is also done with the power saw. This picture shows the actual time it takes to buck off a saw log. If a tree should have fallen in a vine, then wooden wedges are driven in the cut, thereby avoiding a pinch. In good ground, such as shown here, these men rarely had to use their wedges. The wood scaler follows the falling part of the operation and records carefully each log that is cut. The fallers and the woods management know at all times the amount of timber felled. This makes it possible to maintain an even balance between falling and hauling. The company endeavors to keep two million board feet on the ground ahead of the hauling. Now that the roads are built and timber is felled, we go out into the woods after those logs with the equipment you see here. That is the same mobile crane you saw loading gravel. And there are some of the same trucks with log bunks instead of gravel beds. Many of the men are the same that worked on road graveling. Two knot bumpers, two crotch line hookers, top loader, and crane operator. Sometimes the cats have to climb some steep places to get to the log, but they get to the log some way and return down the hill over brush, rocks, or whatever may be in the way. Much caution and skill is exercised by the drivers when going into bad places. This is what is termed ground skidding, and in steep country is about the best way. This cat is equipped with Heister towing winch, which comes in handy in getting logs out of tough places. As the logs are skidded into the landing, loading out trucks goes on, so that the logs do not remain long at the landing. Uh-oh, this looks like a job for the knot bumpers. It's amazing how many limbs can hide under a tree when it's felled. Many times the limbs are broken off while being dragged in, but these limbs came through. The knot bumpers are right on the job with their axes, and the logs are soon ready to go to town. While the logs roll on rubber on their 60-mile trek to the mill, other trucks, having arrived for their second load that day, back under. Trailers are lifted off their backs by the crane, set down as easy as velvet. And a repetition of skidding and loading goes on and on until that landing has served its purpose and all ripe timber has been removed from the adjacent territory. Quitting time. Cats are lined up for servicing. This work is done by the company's serviceman. In the woods, he's called a grease monkey. Special attention is given danger points to ensure maximum safety at all times. The company uses a field service truck equipped with alamite air pressure system. Next morning, it's necessary to move several hundred tons of woods machinery about 25 miles to the summer show, now that the weather is dry enough to leave the gravel roads. The Pointer Willamette machinery trailer is attached to a logging truck. Cats are loaded in this manner and are on their way. Four trips are necessary to move the cats, and by noon, the job is finished. The first cat to be moved is the bulldozer. For the new show, it must prepare landings and turnarounds for the trucks and then go out and build skid trails. The trails should be ready when the skidding cats arrive. Unloading the cats from the machinery trailer is a very simple matter, as is shown here. By using this system and the Lorraine mobile loader, no interruption in production is noticed when long moves are necessary. At the company garage, a truck is just leaving for the new show. 
and it's time to arrive when logs and loader are ready. The skidding boss arrives by pickup to look over the ground on the new show. A landing must be selected and cat trails located so that logs farthest from the landing may be reached when skidding starts. Also, it must be determined where to send the different types of skidding equipment when they arrive. The cats usually go to the back side of the area and pick up logs while headed toward the landing. The bulldozer approaches the new loading out place and is directed by the skidding boss as to where the landing is to be cleared. Also, where to clear the trail for the skidding cats. Thinking cat trails usually consists of pushing aside all down logs and brush that would be in the way of a cat when going out to gather logs. Large obstacles are pushed aside. This system saves considerable wear and tear on skidding cats and makes a dozer unnecessary on a skidding cat, thereby cutting down weight and adding longer life to track rollers and many other parts. It would appear that some damage would be done to reproduction or young trees just starting. It is true some trees are killed in this manner, but as the young growth is usually so thick, the result is that the elimination of a few trees tends to stimulate and make better timber of those remaining. This is just another step in good spacing, like thinning out vegetables so that those remaining may grow faster and produce better quality. This shows the dozer just completing the trails for this landing. As the skinning cats arrive, the drivers and choker setters are directed up the trails where they should start skidding. The first cat to come is using the heister towing winch and arch. The boss has a special chance picked out for it. Of the other two coming, one has just a fan tail for ground getting close and easy ones. And the last cat is the one with the heister towing winch, quite efficient in getting the logs from steep or rocky ground where the line has to be pulled out by hand. This constitutes balance getting power. Let's follow the arch cat out into the woods and see how the choker setter does his work. Bell hooks and knobs are the hooking up device used at the end of a three quarter inch cable. However, the other cats use seven eighth inch cable as they drag their logs on the ground. As you see, one end of the logs are lifted from the ground by the arch, therefore do not have any chance to hang up, and so pull much easier. An average trail of 4,000 feet can be skidded at one time. This particular arch load appears to have over 5,000 feet, but the logs seem light, so he will probably have no trouble making it in. Apparently, the load is being handled easily and will reach the landing okay. As the cat approaches the landing, the unhooker steps up, stops the cat in the right place, and he signals to drop the load. Then he moves forward and unhooks the chokers from the logs. Little time is used and the cat is ready to go back after another load. While the winch cat may have picked up his logs where the arch cat could not work, he seems to be having more trouble getting into the landing. Here's where he is able to drop part of his load and pull in with the other part. And then without much delay can wind the dropped logs in. At this new landing, the ground appears unusually loose. So the logs dig in more when being dragged on the ground than the driver had figured on. Thus, too big a load. And now the bobtail cat, or the one with only a fan tail on its rear, brings in his load. The landing appears to be filling already. And again, the unhooker spots the trail by signaling the driver where to stop and proceeds to unhook. The drivers rarely leave the cat. Now that the landing is filling with logs, the loader is needed to load them on trucks. I'm glad he's cleaned up the last landing on schedule and is on his way. 25 miles is no obstacle for the Lorraine loader, and the tight schedule is maintained. The loader and bus carrying the landing crew arrive almost simultaneously. As the loader pulls in, 
The top loader sizes up the landing. When the loader is far enough ahead, the top loader signals spot. And the landing crew, all having their special jobs, proceeds to pull out the outriggers and screw them down tight. This is all the stabilizing the loader needs. Now it is ready to lift the boom off travel position, swing around and go to work. The superintendent and truck dispatcher had everything figured out pretty closely. For the truck you see backing under is the same one you saw leaving the garage at Pilot Rock for the new landing. Yes, sometimes everything goes right. We hope our luck will still hold. Here again, the trailer is lifted off the truck, set down carefully on the ground, and the loading is ready to start. As trucks are loaded out, more will arrive, and if on schedule, are 10 to 15 minutes apart. Loading time actually takes from 10 to 15 minutes to the load. The drivers rotate their turns, getting up early in the morning. The first truck leaves the garage at Pilot Rock at 5.15 a.m the last one around 8 a.m. The average footage hauled per load on the company's six-wheelers is 5,700. This averages a gross weight of 71,000 pounds. 72,000 is the maximum allowable weight on the state highways. Each truck is equipped with electric scales so the drivers can tell pretty well when they have enough weight. Some logs, while smaller than others, weigh more, depending on how ripe the tree was that it came from. The yearly production of this operation was set for around 20 million board feet of logs. This is maintained easily by operating 10 months in the woods and accumulating surplus at the pond during that time to run the mill the entire year. If loads are safe, in the opinion of the landing boss, they're allowed to move out of the way of the next truck while they chain up. This policy has been followed by the woods management for over 20 years without an accident caused from loading and have saved thousands of dollars in loading time. Loads are securely wrapped with two chains and tighteners are used as this driver is doing. The drivers down in Oregon call the tighteners bear traps. Very confusing. This man doesn't seem to be wasting any time starting, but let's cut across and see this load when it comes down through the desolation gorge. This piece of road cost $20,000 for 600 feet because it had to be shot out of solid rock. The only alternative was going over the top, which necessitated climbing 500 feet higher with every load. The company feels the money was well spent, for over 100 million feet will pass through here. Out on the three-flank highway and past camp, the load rolls on. Around the turn ahead, the road goes up Camas Creek, elevation 2,800 feet. Here is where the 22-mile climb up Battle Mountain starts. By racing ahead, we can beat the loaded truck to the top of the mountain. Looks like that auto car, powered with the 300-horse Paul Scott motor, overtook the Kenworth. Two more auto cars have been added to make up the fleet of log trucks. They make easy work of the 1,500-foot climb to the summit over the top of Battle Mountain, elevation 4,300 feet, and down the other side, 25 miles, lies the mill pond. Part way down the mountain, we asked the truck drivers to wait so we could set up the camera and show some of the beautiful highway scenes. By the time the trucks rounded this curve, two more had caught up, and we didn't make them wait long either. Out of the timberlands and down into the great grasslands of the Blue Mountain foothills, the loads roll on and on, 25 miles of downhill. Here is where those Westinghouse air brakes come into good use. Stopping 35 tons requires good brakes, yet the linings on their brake drum sometimes last 100,000 miles. There goes an empty back after another load. 
After dropping 2,500 feet in the descent from the mountains, the drivers are greeted with these signs just at the city limits of Pilot Rock. There's no question what they mean, so the trucks roll onto the scales, hesitate just a moment while the front axle, rear axle, and trailer are all carefully and accurately weighed. This weighing of all loads helps to keep an even distribution of the weight and adds much to controlling load maximums so that maximum life can be had from both the trucks and the roads. The company's policy is to protect both the roads and the trucks because both are needed to get the lifeblood that keeps the hundreds of men and machines busy. The waymaster is very courteous but stern and if the loggers get careless and the truck is overloaded, fines are given. The load of logs must be scaled carefully and accurately before it is dumped into the pond. The scaler records the scale for each truck so that the management will know at all times the amount of logs hauled by each and the total daily volume delivered. It usually takes about five minutes to get rid of a load of logs weighing approximately 22 tons. An electric hoist is used for power and is quite satisfactory. A concrete ramp had to be built to protect the bank from the wash. Loading trailers on the backs of the unloaded trucks is done by the same electric device. There are two unloading devices at the pond, one at each end, so if one should break down or one landing become plugged, the other can be used. And now that the truck is unloaded, it draws out of the mill yard, onto the highway, back over the mountains after another load. And now to see what happens to the log next. First, the pond man with long cocks in his boots moves out onto the logs carrying a pike pole. Oh yes, he falls in once in a while. He admits to three times one summer. The log is guided up to the chute and the teeth of the bull chain connect with the underside of the log. And the timber is on one end of a moving line of rollers that eventually ends at the shipping car door, a very proud product of pine. However, that is another story, the sequel to this yarn. Before the log reaches the saw, it must be thoroughly washed under pressure so that all rocks and soil may be kept from the keen steel of the whining bandsaw. Washing is important to added efficiency and saving of costs. It takes time to chain saws, and while saws are being changed, no boards are being made. Another part of the operation is the decking of surplus logs that accumulate during the 10 logging months so that the mill can continue to operate during the two months logging shutdown that occurs every spring when the frost comes out of the ground and the earth is so soft it would mire a saddle blanket. The Lorraine loader you saw back there in the woods 60 miles follows a logging truck in on a Friday night whenever needed and will deck about a half million feet during a weekend. It returns at a speed of 30 miles an hour and is on hand to load logs Monday morning. Tearing the deck down in the spring is also done with the loader. Now that the logs are in and decked, let's return to the woods by plane. Yes, the Pilot Rock Lumber Company has its own landing field right in the middle of a vast timber area. The field was cleared, graded, and rolled by the equipment you saw working on the roads and required only two and a half days to build. The runway we land on is 1,600 feet long, 100 feet wide, and fairly smooth, so there is nothing to worry about. There is the other landing strip running east and west, which is a thousand feet long, and which we could use if the wind had made it necessary. The trees you see near the runway are to be cut next winter. This will improve the clearance considerably. Two flyers from Prosser, Washington landed here last Sunday. They were nearly out of gas and looking for Pendleton, Oregon, 60 air miles away. We got them fixed up and directed out. They were really lucky this field was here. We forgot to mention we have a vital cat part aboard that the boys need badly out here. And if they don't get it, production is liable to suffer tomorrow. Here is the production superintendent in that blue pickup. Betty's glad we got here in time. 
That was the part he wanted, all right, and he isn't going to waste any time talking, but is taking right out in the pickup for the injured cab. The mechanics will still have time to put it in. Thanks to prompt delivery by this Blue Mountain Air Service plane, their skilled pilots, and this landing field. Let's taxi down the runway and take off. Here we go. We're off the ground and into the bright blue yonder. We're glad it's such a nice clear day because we want to show you some timber and logging roads from the air. It's nice up here. We might as well fly around a bit. We leave the main Desolation Creek area and fly up Starbuck Creek a ways. Notice the network of roads that have made 50 million feet of timber accessible for logging. If we had time, we'd visit two other areas where road work is far ahead of the loggers. But let's get back toward town before our fuel runs low. So we'll say goodbye for the present until we continue our story of how logs are made into finished furniture, ironing boards, and hundreds of other good uses that constitute quality pine products. <laughs>